So what are ChatGPTs and LLMs? Now I can't actually, I mean I could give you several slides and explain it to you and have um, you know, more than half the room bored and terrified because it's a ton of math. We're not going to do that. I'm going to give you a couple things. It's really the core operation that underlies ChatGPT is something called a matrix multiplication, which you can see here. And a lot of actually fairly basic math if you understand what a matrix multiplication is. It's just strung together in some clever ways and really, really, really big, big matrices, and a lot of them, and like this orchestrated dance of mixing numbers together. And um, what you do is you kind of uh, take text and change it into numbers. You follow me? And then you basically kind of stir the pot <laughs> in this predefined way and that's learned from data how to basically predict what the next word is. And out of that, you, um, if you can get really, really good at predicting the next word, it turns out you have to be really good at doing a lot of things. <laughs> And that's, that's the core idea. Now, it's a lot bigger. It's, it's a computer program, but it's not a normal computer program. All right? You can't run it on your laptop. You can't even run it on your desktop at home. You have to have one of these machines here that I have here as a picture. Um, and, and, and you can see that there's eight blocks right here. Each of these is a state-of-the-art GPU. Each one of these GPUs alone is far more, um, it's called a graphic processing unit because it's the same hardware that we used to use just for like, you know, video games and stuff, but it's kind of an anachronism right now because it's not processing any graphics. It's just gotten really, really good at doing matrix math. <laughs> and you need to have all eight of them running at once, kind of interconnected to one another. This machine itself costs around $200,000. Um, and yeah, you have to, and, and, and ChatGPT lives across all eight of those GPUs. And whenever you, know, you kind of type a response, all that test gets turned into numbers and gets filtered through those eight GPUs to give you what its response is. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> um, it, it takes about five kilowatts or so to run this thing. Um, a lot of them are like water-cooled or air-cooled because it's just an immense amount of electricity. There's around 170, uh, 180 um, billion weights or connections in this, in this model. Um, and that's important because, you know, the next version of it is going to have about a trillion or so. And that's starting to approach the same order of magnitude of the number of connections in our own brain. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> this thing is actually going to be coming, I mean, it's really on the same order of processing power of the human, of the human brain. Of course, it's far less efficient. We, we only need a few watts of energy, <laughs> maybe about 20 watts of energy to run our brains. And, is, and if you think that's not that much, at the same token, that's, a, that's quite a bit of the energy output of a human. You actually use about as much energy thinking hard sitting down as you do running. <laughs> Your brain uses an immense amount of energy when it's thinking. Isn't that cool, too? <laughs> um, and uh, anyways, so there's still some differences here. Um, but it, it's, it, it's not, this is, you would be a mistake to think that this is the brain of ChatGPT in the same way we have a brain, right? Because our brains, we can't really bounce between computers, right? <laughs> this is just software running on hardware. If this, is, this is where it is now, and it'll be somewhere else down the line, right? So that's what ChatGPT is. And, but you can have a conversation with this computer that, um, that will be surprising. <laughs> and you can do it for free now, too. So these have been like in, hidden away in, in large companies for a while. But OpenAI made this available for anyone to actually just use right now and have these conversations. And that's why it's just gotten really huge over the last couple months. Now, a lot of this conversation brings back, me back to a lot of old ideas. So this is Alan Turing. He's a mathematician. Any mathematicians here? Yeah, there's one. <laughs> so he's the guy who actually conceived of the idea of, um, of a computer or a Turing machine, like a universal computer before they'd really, uh, really been invented. He's able to show that, this, that, you, that if you had um, like the right arrangement of parts and the way you could do this, you could actually make a universal computing machine. He was an atheist, and he really thought that people were just machines anyways. And so you know, if people can have minds, the machines can have minds too. And you know, consciousness should be computable, was his theory. And he wanted to say, OK, so how is it that we would actually be able to tell whether or not a machine became conscious? And um, he came up with a Turing test, which is this idea that you'd put, um, uh, you'd, you'd have a person here, person A, 
who's trying to figure out if this person he's chatting with or this person he's chatting with is a real person or a computer. And if, when he did this multiple times, you know, he'd be right 50% of the time and wrong 50% of the time, that means that a computer has actually achieved, you know, general intelligence. That was his idea. This still raises a lot of questions, though. Is that really a mind? Um, and a lot of people have criticized this. I'm going to give you one of the most important uh, people who have criticized it in just a moment. But you can, you can see what the problems are with this. And one of the first ways that people figured out that there was a problem is when they tried to actually do this is they found out one of the best ways to figure out if it was a, it was a computer or if it was a person was to just give it like a, like a relatively complicated arithmetic problem. And the computer could solve it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> and quickly. <laughs> uh, humans always took longer. It's like, say, aha, now I know how to fix it. I'll just make my computer slower and less intelligent, <laughs> more error prone, and it'll be. So, so it's, this is a bit of a problem, right? That's not, that, that doesn't make sense. We've we got to make the computer more stupid to actually work with us. Well, um, you know, that was one problem that people really thought about. And it really came down to the fact that the early artificial intelligence algorithms that were trying to be generally intelligent were actually working by very different principles than the human brain. And so um, it wasn't working by symbolic manipulation in quite the same way um, that the humans are, and maybe even a lot closer to what chat GPT is doing. That's why I was saying it's interesting that it makes the same sorts of arithmetic errors that we do. <laughs> um, that's because it's actually working in some ways that are far more isomorphic to what we're doing as, as humans. But then, you know, um, through this too, this kind of came up, you know, for the longest time, people thought what was unique about humans is that we're rational. But people started to think, well, actually, computers are pretty rational. Maybe what's unique about humans is that we have emotions, <laughs> right? So you, if you guys have ever watched Star Trek, um, you'll see data, right? <laughs> which is a really interesting flip on the, on the understanding of what it means to be human. Because historically, people thought of what makes people human was that we are rational. And you know, we have emotions, but those are our baser instincts. <laughs> that, that, you know, that isn't really the, the most human part of who we are, our emotions. But then it kind of flipped over when we found out the machines could be more rational than us. We thought, well, the part that really, that's really hard is the emotional part. Um, and then we have you know, ChatGPT trying to, to get us to divorce our wife. So I don't know. <laughs> But we're still left with this problem, though, of like, OK, is a, is a task of just trying to emulate on the outside what a human is or like what consciousness is? What, what, how do we know about the internal state? For, for when it comes to our own minds, we, have, we can directly perceive it. Like as Descartes said, you know, we think, therefore we are. When it comes to another person, we don't have a direct way of perceiving it, but we know uh, that we have a common ontogeny. We, we kind of both started out the same way, became humans, grew up the same way. And we have, very, we have a pretty good, proper, basic belief that everyone else has a mind. And that's the important thing. Because if we didn't have minds, we could treat each other as things, and that would be a problem, right? So how do we cross that gap? Well, it's not easy. So one of the most important critiques of Alan, uh, Alan Turing and the Turing test was John Searle in the Chinese room. He kind of um, really put out this idea of saying, well, what if there's a room where they had a ton of people who don't speak any Chinese? Okay. But they have these big books that tell you how to manipulate Chinese characters. And then if a person who comes that speaks Chinese and then kind of puts in some Chinese into the, into the, into the room, and then a people just, there's this big factory of people running around and just moving around the symbols, and they come back, and they kind of spit out another answer, and they look at it and say, oh, wow, that's really coherent text. I guess there's someone in there that really understands Chinese. So the question is, well, actually, does anyone understand Chinese in there? Well, I already told you, none of them speak Chinese. None of them really understand it. So what do you do with that problem? If none of the individual parts actually understand it, can it really understand it at the higher level? So that's been one of the big questions that's been mulling around amongst philosophers for a long time. And it's a bit complicated. It's not easy to answer because, um, because you're still seeing kind of like this emergent reality of this, this human machine made up of parts, you know, with like a book where they're kind of manipulating symbols, still being able to have a conversation with a Chinese person, right? So you can start wondering about that. And you know, a lot of people say, well, if you just kind of look at that, you could say, well, it's not. I mean, it's not understanding as the way we normally think about it, because it's just people running around in a box who don't understand what the symbols are, pushing them around. It's not understanding. 
Now, alongside this, there's been a lot of advances in neuroscience. These are some um, hand drawings from Ramoni Cajal, who got a Nobel Prize for discovering the neuron theory of the brain, or the information processing theory. His idea was that he looked at the shape of neurons and said, well, maybe it's taking information in from the dendrites and sending it along the axons, and that's how it works. He got a Nobel Prize for that. Uh, and it's just from looking at the anatomy. It's, it's really brilliant, beautiful stuff. But here's the thing. Um, without belaboring the point, if you actually look at the human brain and how, I mean, we all know that we have consciousness and we have minds. Our brains look more and more like a Chinese room. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, are we just merely um, a bunch of non-understanding neurons? Or do we have a mind? Well, we know we have a mind. So a lot of the arguments that we use if, against saying chat GPT has a mind, for example, is like, well, it's just a bunch of numbers being pushed around. Well, our brains are just a bunch of information processing. That doesn't mean that we don't have a mind. So, so even though I don't think that ChatGPT has a mind yet, uh, we have to be careful about those sorts of arguments because they actually apply just as well to us sometimes, too. <laughs> and so maybe it's not, but we have to kind of think through carefully, how do we know it's not? So, why is this still interesting and fun and worth doing if we don't know? Well, like I said, there has been a big change. There's some people out there who have been conversing with this thing who are actual experts who are like, well, I think this thing might be getting sentient. I think this is bringing us back to this grand question about which you know, all great philosophy, art, literature is really about, which is this grand question of what it means to be human, the human condition. That's what we're really wondering about and asking about here. I think it's fair to say that um, these large language models and artificial intelligence is actually quite a bit like us, even in some very surprising sorts of ways. 